So on Thursday, we talked about 12.3, which was about Parliament and the King and England constantly getting into fights with one another. Now we're going to be talking about 12.4, which deals with the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution. Personally, I find this topic to be immensely interesting, and I hope you do as well. We're, so last time around, we were talking about a lot of people just doing things and lots of politics. This one is much more focused on ideas and how ideas change. Okay? And if, of course, if you need me to slow down, please let me know. You don't have to write this down. This is just uh, our objectives for this PowerPoint presentation. We're going to talk about how science led to the Enlightenment. We're going to talk about political philosophies, Hobbes, Locke, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Rousseau. We're going to talk about some of the economic ideas that are changing, so on and so forth. And let's just get it going. So during the scientific revolution of the 1500s and 1600s, European scholars made advances in physics, astronomy, chemistry, biology, medicine, amongst many others. Mathematics as well. Sorry, that's not on the list. Hello. Here you go. Have a great day. So the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution are very closely related together. Some makes the argument that uh, the scientific revolution led to the Enlightenment. And I've also uh, heard some various arguments that uh, the Protestant Reformation itself let, helped to lead to the scientific revolution and to the Enlightenment. Because the Protestant Reformation challenged the authority of the church very directly. So this slide is about the scientific revolution. We're going to go over some of the big names and some of their accomplishments. I bet you know almost all of them. For instance, Galileo. Very famous for astronomy. Specifically, what is he famous for? Well, uh, what about uh, not the stars? Yeah. Wasn't he like the one that said um, that the Earth isn't the center of the universe? No. Okay. Well, okay. So he 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 kind of went along with that, but that's not what he's really famous for. Look at the meme. Saturn. Did you hear that story? Saturn. Look, Saturn. look at the meme. <laughs> The sun, guys, come on. He stared at the sun with a telescope. It's not a good idea. No, but because he did that, he was able to discover sunspots. He, he had no idea that there were sunspots until he stared at the sun. Um, he also identified the moon, some of the moons of Jupiter. So there are the Galilean moons. I think it's, what is it, Io. Others. <laughs> I only remember Io. Uh, he was also persecuted by the church because of some of his scientific discoveries. Then we have Nicholas Copernicus developed the heliocentric model of the solar system. What does heliocentric mean? Sun. Good. Sun in the center of the solar system. Before we developed that, uh, many people believed that the Earth was the center of the solar system, and the sun and the moon and all the planets went around it. But if you look at the math, it just doesn't add up. It just doesn't make any sense. It only really works if you put the sun in the middle. And now we're 99% certain. That, or you can't, you can't be 100% certain with anything, can you? Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure you can be 100% certain? Are you certain? So I don't. I just thought this was funny. Um, if you watch <laughs> Frasier, I recommend highly recommend watching Frasier. It's on Netflix. It's a great show. Then we have Tycho Brahe. He stared at the moon. Much safer occupation than staring at the sun. He was kind of the first one that really uh, started mapping out some of the features of the moon. He was also very uh, prolific with mathematics. And he also had a bit of a temper, and he got into a duel with someone, and they cut off his nose, and then he had a fake nose for the rest of his life. Yeah. Yeah. In that painting, is it fake or is that real? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, what were they fighting over? I think, if I, if I remember correctly, they were disagreeing over some math problem. <laughs> <laughs> what a 
what a wonderful way to lose your nose. Again, take that with a grain of salt. That's just off the top of my head. I, that's what I remember it being. Then you have Johannes Kepler, developed the idea of planetary motion. So people had observed the planets moving, but he's the first one to really map out mathematically how they move. Do the planets move in a circle? No. No, no. what do they move in? An oval. An oval. Also known as an elliptical orbit. Oh. Did you, were you saying elliptical? Yes. Nice. <laughs> no, I was saying that's cool. I know this is a terrible oval. You're like, you started off great. Now, what's interesting about this, though, is that for many, many years, especially um, within the church, uh, people believed that the planets moved in a perfect circle. That is not a perfect circle. <laughs> uh, for the sake of argument, let's say it's a perfect circle. The reason that they believe that is they thought that the circle is the perfect shape and that God, having created the universe, would have wanted it to be perfect to perfect circle. Johannes Kepler says, no, math doesn't want to add up. It's an elliptical. Does that make sense? No. So a lot of these guys are really challenging previously, you know, previous con uh, conceptions. And then, of course, we got Sir Francis Bacon. He really developed the scientific method that we all know and love today. Yeah. Um, so it's the same guy who's the painter? Is it because I know there's Francis Bacon, the painter? I don't know. I am not sure. We can look it up some other time. So what is the scientific method? What are the steps? Question. Hypothesis. So we got a question or a problem that we need to solve. We develop a hypothesis, Mo. Uh, we study or like we test, right? So yeah, so then we have our problem. We develop a hypothesis. We develop a, an experiment to figure out our hypothesis. We, make, we gather our data, we make observations, and then we make a conclusion. Were we right, were we wrong? And then of course, repeat the whole thing. That, I mean, people have been doing science before this, but Francis Bacon really systematized it and said, these are the steps that we need to do for consistent scientific analysis. He did all sorts of uh, experiments in his own day. For instance, he realized that if you refrigerate meat, it lasts longer. In order to test that hypothesis, he put a chicken in the snowbank outside his house and then left it overnight, then came back in the morning and ate it. Turned out that it wasn't it cold enough and either. <laughs> so make sure you refrigerate your meat, people. And of course, so we got. <laughs> well, learn. This is why we study history. Learn from the past. Don't eat raw chicken. Or eat eat chicken that is you know spoiled. Anyway. So we have all of these guys, and this is just a short list. There are plenty of other scientists and math, uh, mathematicians and doctors who are all trying to figure out how the world works. And during this time period, we have a lot of discoveries being made about the natural world, the physical laws of the universe. We're figuring out things about math. For instance, the golden ratio or the Fibonacci sequence, does anyone know that? Yeah. One, one, two, three, five, some other numbers yeah. down a whole long list. Yeah. Now it's fascinating though, that golden ratio can be found in almost everything, like, you know, the trail of a hurricane, or uh, leaves, or you know, petals on a flower, you can see the golden ratio there. Yeah, you can also see it in the spirals, uh, on snails, yeah. Sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds also have it. Uh, there's also a golden ratio in the human face itself. Yeah. That's a great question. <laughs> uh, I don't know it off the top of my head, but basically it's this. It's it's similar to the Fibonacci sequence, isn't it? One, one, yeah, three, five. Off, yeah. yeah. So this is the golden ratio. Do you see how it's divided in half and then divided in half, divided in half, on and on and on. Yeah. Anyway. So this, this ratio can be observed in all sorts of things, especially in spirals. And it can also be observed in the hair of the president. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's funny. 
<laughs> All right, any questions about this? So we talked about we talked about Bacon, we talked about Kepler, we talked about uh, Copernicus. What really big name have we left out? Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton. Thank you. Sir Isaac Newton gets his own slide. Sir Isaac Newton was a genius. Probably insane, but also just a stone cold genius. He invented calculus. Okay. <laughs> is anyone taking pre calc or calc? Go. I'll help you. <laughs> Goodness help you. I never took it. It's not good enough. He also is the one that really identified the concept of gravity. You know, we're being pulled to the center of the earth at all times. Uh, he had his three laws of motion. Um, so various, uh, sorry, uh, various scientific discoveries, various mathematical discoveries. He became a professor at Oxford University. It wasn't Oxford. Anyway, he became a professor at a university when he was like 24. Very young guy, super smart. Um, he was also a theologian, so he wrote a lot about God and his beliefs in God. Um, he also was a mathematician, and he was also very interested in alchemy. Does anyone know what alchemy is? Yeah. Yeah. So it's trying to turn one substance into another. It's kind of like a really early version of chemistry in a lot of ways. Um, so for instance, they were very interested in turning lead into gold. Wasn't it turning everything into gold? Yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> Newton, along with a lot of, because Newton wrote extensively about alchemy. 10% of his writings are about alchemy. So he spent a significant amount of time on it. He was also very interested in discovering the Philosopher's Stone, which uh, supposedly would turn things into gold and also grant eternal life. Uh, Newton was a fan of Nicholas Flamel. Who's Nicholas Flamel? Um, he's he's rumored to be he is in Harry Potter. Say again? He's rumored to be immortal. Ru Let's be honest, is he immortal? No. no, he died a long time ago. But he is, he was in Harry Potter. Nicholas Flamel is an actual person. Didn't he know that. It. Yeah. You learn new things every day. But he died a very long time ago. Yeah. yeah. So then where did the rumor of him being immortal come Probably because he was working on the Philosopher's Stone. And the idea is that it grants eternal life. There's a whole book That's series of uh, fiction on Nicholas Flamel. Yeah. Has anyone seen um, As Above, So Below? No. Oh, that movie is good. Uh, Grant's Eternal Life. If you like horror movies, As Above, So Below is really good. It's like kind of parents watching yeah. 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 Have you seen it? Um, I've seen the trailers and I've meaning to watch it. The movie is really good. And Nicholas Fl no, sorry if it's spoilers. Nicholas Flamel is in the movie. Or supposedly. Yeah. Anyway, so he was very interested in alchemy, and <laughs> he was interested in it to the point that he, for one of his experiments, he started drinking mercury. Oh, oh that's 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 Hey man, he was the, one of the smartest people ever. Into calculus. Why is drinking mercury a bad idea? Well, 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 well you can do it once. Okay. Yeah. Mercury is a heavy metal, and once it gets into your system, it's pretty much there <laughs> until you die. And it causes this recurring poisoning. It also starts rotting your brain. Ooh. So when, and he did this a lot, by the way. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think one time is a lot. <laughs> but he, did it, he did it more than once. Uh, so by the time that... By the time that he actually passed away, he, he wasn't all there mentally because mercury starts breaking down your brain. So let's learn from the smartest man not to do this. I just thought this was funny. Any questions about the scientific revolution about Newton? Yeah. Um, how does he invent calculus? Like, like, if, what is... if I remember, he was 
he was making observations about some sort of motion. I think it was either like planets moving or something like that. But he wanted to figure out how fast they were going, but he couldn't. So he just invented calculus to figure it out. Okay. <laughs> so basically, we're learning something so we decided to pursue it. <laughs> All right. So that was that was the scientific revolution. Now we're getting into the enlightenment. And the enlightenment can sit up. Sit up. The enlightenment is very focused on let's use our reason, let's use our brains. Let's not just rely on tradition, like, oh, it's always been this way. Let's not just rely on faith. Let's try to figure things out using our brains. And in so doing, they end up challenging a lot of things in society. So one of the first people, and this is going to be focusing on like political ideas. So Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes argues that we need a very strong powerful government to keep everyone in line. Basically, he basically wanted a fascist dictatorship in many ways. Um, he was very worried about what he called the state of nature. The state of nature. This is basically the way people live without government. So, like way back when, before government even existed, he had conceived of this idea of the state of nature. Yeah. Be quick. His idea of the state of nature was a war of all against all. You can kind of see that in this. During the time, men live without a common power, so the government, to keep them all in awe. They are in that condition called war. And such a war as if of every man against every man. Have you, has anyone seen The Purge? Show your hand. I need to. This is also the Hunger Games. Yeah, we're going to watch it together. Yeah, we got to watch that. So if you remember from The Purge, the premise is at midnight on this one day, all emergency services are cut off for 12 hours, and anything goes. And so what do people do in the movie? They start killing each other. They start rampaging, setting things on fire. It's just a rampage. Hobbes believed that if we don't have a government, it will be like that every single day. Oh. So we need, according to Hobbes, we need to have a strong government because otherwise we'll just kill each other in the streets. And he also said that he also said that life in the state of nature without a government is nasty, brutish, and short. And I personally would like to have a nice life that is comfortable and long. Wouldn't you? So he believed that the king is the embodiment of the will of the people. And that when the king acts, he is doing so in the interests of everyone. <laughs> why, just, why did you laugh? How dare you? Don't you? Do you want chaos in the streets? Yes. <laughs> All right, are we ready? So this is Hobbes' idea, and he's a very interesting guy. I would recommend reading into him a bit more. Um, on the flip side, there's another man that very much disagreed with Hobbes. His name was John Locke, and he focused on natural rights. He wrote about it quite a lot. A natural right... <laughs> Another way of saying it is, you could also call it a, a God-given right, depending on, on your theology. Can anyone give you these rights? God. But besides that, can anyone? No. 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 These are rights that every human being is born with. The moment they emerge into the world, they have these rights that no one is allowed to take away except for some caveats that we'll get to in a second. <laughs> so, <laughs> according to Locke, there are three major ones that everyone has. So what three rights do you have? Say again. Okay. Uh, 
to exist. What's another way of saying that? To, to live. To live. Life. Oh. What else? Speech. Oh, uh, it's connected to speech. Oh. Uh, mm. <laughs> it's connected <laughs> to that. It's a bit more broad. To think. To think. It's connected to that. A bit more broad. Free will. Free will. Oh, close to free will. Sean, say what you said. What did you say, Sean? <laughs> okay, so no. say again. Who said freedom? Freedom. <laughs> What's another word for freedom with an L? Liberty. Freedom, which includes freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of to do what you want. And there's one last one. Please let it be an L. It's not. Dang it. Oh. 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 So that, that, that goes back to the... Uh, hold on, hold on. So that goes back to the Declaration of Independence, which was very strong. Does this sound familiar? Yes. Yes. So you can tell that Locke very much influenced the Declaration of Independence. Starts with a P, but it's not pursuit of power. Peace. Not peace. Because peace can go along with that. Um... <laughs> Well, not that. Okay, how about this? How about this? These are mine, though. I wore a whole spot. What are these two? Possessions. Possessions? What's another word for property? Property! I said that first. I stopped myself. All right, shh. Settle, settle, settle. Life, liberty, property. These are God-given rights. Well, depending on your theology. These are natural rights that every human being is born with. And can the government just take it away from you? No. No. Nada. What's the exception, though? Uh, Unless you're a criminal. Like, Say it. Unless you're a criminal. Unless you break the law. Oh. If I yeah. violate yeah. someone else's rights, do I have my rights anymore? No. No. These are mine, though. What's going to happen to me now? <laughs> I will get arrested, I will get go to jail, I will then go to trial, and then at the trial they'll say, you stole a bunch of highlighters, and I'll go to prison. To death. prison. <laughs> death. So, settle now. Settle. So every human being has these rights according to John Locke, unless you violate the rights of others. Now, with this, though, does, does he want the government messing with you? No. No. I mean, look at this. The only task of the government is the protection of private property. He does not want the government bossing people around and telling people what to do. So he's very much in favor of a republic, a free government, and he really wants a small government. There's a famous phrase. I can't remember who said it, but he's, they said I want a government small enough that I can drown it in my bathtub. <laughs> I can't remember who said that. I need to look it up. And John Locke famously said this, All mankind being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. So you have, on one hand, Thomas Hobbes saying we need a big government. On the other... We need a small government. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions? Does anyone need the slide still? Mm -hmm. I just thought this was funny, since they argue so much. <laughs> so, Hobbes' book... Right. Thomas Hobbes wrote a book called The Leviathan, this is actually on the cover of the Leviathan. What is this a picture of? The king. The king. And the king. And the people are. Yeah, yes, thank you. The people are the king. And what is he ruling over? The land. Everything in the land. So this is very much in, in line with what Hobbes is thinking about. It is kind of scary, I'll be honest. So now we're talking about the philosophes. These guys were around in the 1700s. Um, they were 
a key part of the Enlightenment, and they were focused in France. They were centralized in France. And basically, they would meet with each other in their, in their living rooms, and they'd talk about politics and philosophy, and they'd criticize the government, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and the philosophers believed that human beings, using our reason, we can do anything that we set our minds to. That nothing is outside of the scope of our ability to think. That if you give us the chance to think, we'll be able to fix everything. We can fix society using our brains. <laughs> and overall, they called for many reforms to both the government and the society to protect people's natural rights, to give people more say in the government. Any questions? So let's talk about some specific philosophers. For instance, we have Montesquieu. Montesquieu calls for a separation of powers in the government. He did this in his book, The Spirit of the Laws, in 1748. So what branches of government are there? Think about the US. Judicial, what do they do? They make sure that the executive branch is It's not kind of, but it's not just their job. The judicial branch interprets the law. What does the executive do? Yes, executes the law or enforces the law. What does legislative do? It makes, it makes the law. So we have one group of people who make the laws. We have one people, one group that enforce the law, a law enforcement officer. Then we have the judicial, which interprets the law. So these people say, okay, this thing is illegal, and then you break the law, so these people arrest you, and then these people say, you broke the law, now you go to jail. And that's the whole process. Why, why are they separate from one another? To break up the power. To break up the power. Would you trust one person with all of these? No. No, I definitely would not. No. But under what system of government is it the case that these are all the same person? A monarchy. A monarchy. What kind of monarchy? Absolute. Absolute. An absolute monarchy. In an absolute monarchy, the king is the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Can sit up. Look until you get it. So Montesquieu is very famous for this idea of separating the powers. What country was very strongly influenced by this idea? America. The United States of America. Yeah. <laughs> so now we move on to Voltaire. Voltaire was a prolific writer and essayist in the mid-1700s. No, who was it? Anyway, he was a very strong supporter of freedom of speech. He almost radically supported freedom of speech. He very famously said that, I disagree with what you say, but I will fight to the death your right to say it. So he wanted freedom of speech for everyone. Those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. If you want to know who controls you, look at who you are not allowed to criticize. What do you think of that one? Can That's you think of any examples? Crazy. Who are you not allowed to criticize? Trump. Really? You're not allowed to criticize Trump? Uh, we still don't read. I, what are you talking about? We're not allowed to criticize Trump. What did I just do on the first slide? <laughs> How about in your personal life? Is there anyone? Parents. parents. You're definitely not allowed to criticize your parents, especially to their face. You're not allowed to criticize me to my face. Now, that being said, <laughs> you could probably say, like, hey, Mr. J, this activity, we, maybe we could do this activity this way. That's a fair criticism. I'll take that. 
Or like, hey, Mr. J, I think you made a mistake on my essay. But if you go up to me and say, you're an idiot. <laughs> no. We're going to have a very different conversation. So Voltaire. Now, Voltaire was very controversial, especially against the government, and he very much attacked the church. But he did not attack the church as much as Denis Diderot did. Denis Diderot? So Denis Diderot wrote what was called the Encyclopedia, which is very different from the encyclopedia we think of. When we think of the encyclopedia, we think of it's a book form of Wikipedia. Basically. <laughs> This was much more, it had a lot of information, but it also had a lot of opinion essays in it. So like uh, attacks against the church, criticisms of the institution of slavery, criticisms of a absolute monarchy. And it was very popular, so popular to the point that the government of France tried to ban it outright. And the, the Pope actually said, if you a Catholic, if a Catholic buys this book, they will be excommunicated from the church. Meaning kicked out of the church and condemned to where? Hell. Because you can't repent if you don't go to church, right? At least according to the theology. Now, to be fair to them, Diderot once said this. Man will never be free until the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. Oh, fine. <laughs> 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 so can you imagine, can you understand the uh, hostility <laughs> between the two? I get it. I get it. <laughs> Moving forward, we get to Rousseau, Jean Jacques Rousseau. He talks about the social contract. So he has this idea that the government and society, we are all working together, and that when we are working together, we have a contract with one another to interact. Um, he was very much anti-monarchy, very much in pro-democracy. Pro he wanted the people to make decisions. Uh, so much so that he made the argument that the, <laughs> that the government itself is the will of the people. And if you go against the will of the people, then it's okay for you to be executed. So that, there's that. Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. People in their natural state are basically good, but this natural innocence, however, is corrupted by the evils of society. Uh, this is not just the only stuff that he talked about. He also wrote a book called Emile. He wrote a book called Emile, which gave people a lot of uh, advice on how to raise their children, the proper way to raise their children. However, <laughs> however, Rousseau had five illegitimate children with prostitutes, and then he dumped all of them into orphanages, never to be seen again. <laughs> Bit of a hypocrite. <laughs> yes. Essentially, that it goes back to the idea that society corrupts us and we're born innocent. Um, he, he's very much an advocate of radically changing society in order to radically change ourselves, if that makes sense. But you'd have to read the book on your own to get more, more detail. And last but not least, for this slide at least, we have Mary Wollstonecraft who was very, very influential in the early feminist movement. So all of these guys, all of these guys are saying, the common man should have more say in the government. And Mary Wollstonecraft says, what about women? And all the men say, no, get away, only men. But this is the, the start of the early feminist movement where they're trying to get women to have more say in the government, more say in society. Mary Wollstonecraft's daughter actually wrote Frankenstein. Whoa, and, really? Okay, by show of hands, who, who recognizes the name Frankenstein? Thank goodness. Oh my word. I had some people last hour that they had no idea what Frankenstein was. What are you talking about? What? 
Okay, how can you not? Okay, it's fine. Let it go. Any questions on this slide? All right, I'm moving on. So let's talk a bit about some new economic ideas that are out there, specifically laissez-faire economics. So the story goes that one day the king of France was talking with his advisors and they were saying, look, the economy is going down the tubes. We need to do something to figure it out. We don't know what to do. And the king of France said, fine, I'm going to go out to, and talk to the workers, the people who are actually doing things, and try to figure out what it is that we need to do. So supposedly, the story goes, he goes down to the dock workers and he goes down there seeing them you know, hauling cargo and running their businesses and doing all this work. He walks up to them and says, I am the king of France. I have absolute power in this country. I want to help you better the economy. So you tell me what I should do and I will do it. And the workers are working, they pause, they listen to him. And supposedly the story goes, they say, les ne faire and then they get back to work. Laissez nous faire means leave us alone. <laughs> leave us alone. And then that was shortened down to laissez faire. The whole idea of laissez faire is that there should be no government intervention at all. No government intervention. I don't think that's a thing. No government intervention in the market. So no regulations, no taxes. The government needs to keep its nose out of our business according to this idea. In other words, it is a complete free market. And ever since then, this idea has proliferated amongst many people, especially like, for instance, uh, libertarians, uh, anarcho-capitalists very much are into this idea. Um, Ayn Rand is very much into this idea. If you're interested in her writings, I have some of hers. Uh, capitalism is a social system based on the recognition of individual rights, including property rights, in which all property is privately owned. But one of the biggest figures that really supports this idea, Ayn Rand is a much more modern figure, uh, is Adam Smith. He wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, and in many ways, he's considered to be the father of economics as a study. It is not from the benevolence. Let's pause right there. What does benevolence mean? Say again. Yeah, goodness of your heart kindness, charity. So it's not from the kindness of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Take about 30 seconds to talk with each other. What does that mean? Mr. Smith mean by this? Yeah. He's, they're doing, the, the 
the people who sell us food are, are doing it out of their own interest because we will give them money and then they can live their lives with money. Good. That's essentially what he's saying. But to be fair, do you, are when you do your job, are you doing it out of the kindness of your heart? No. 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 Do you think I do this because of the kindness of my heart? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I get paid. Oh, you don't know my paycheck. Now let's put it. Let's put it really bluntly. When you go to Walmart, does the cashier at Walmart care about you? No. No. You don't know that. <laughs> oh, you know what? You want to know how I know? I worked at Walmart. Oh, yeah. I don't care. <laughs> when I cashiered, like, That's have you. a nice day. Mm. <laughs> and the next one. They don't care about you. Now, that being said, when I go to Walmart, do I really care about the cashier? No. But, would my life be better or worse if that cashier didn't exist? Worse. It would be worse. Would their life be better or worse if I didn't exist? Worse. Worse. Because if, if there's not enough customers, what happens to the business? It goes down. What happens to the employees? They don't get paid, they get fired, they have to lose their jobs. And we could expand this out. Does the CEO of Walmart care about me? No. no. They're counting their millions. Do I really care about them? No. No, they're probably jerks, I don't know. I'm not, impl I'm not implying that they're jerks, I'm just saying. They could, they could be jerks. But, would my life be better off if they didn't exist? No. no. So he's pointing out that we, it's a very strange thing. Maybe if you've never thought about it, think about it. We go about our lives, we go about our days, running our businesses, doing our jobs, all of yada, and most of the time we're doing it very selfishly to benefit us. But even though we're doing it selfishly, we end up benefiting everyone. Isn't that a weird thought? Yeah. That's how the economy works, essentially. Just people doing their jobs. And I just thought this was funny. Hey, you know how we sit around every night grousing about the way nobody agrees with us about how society works? Yeah? yeah? What if we mathematize that? <laughs> I think it's funny. You don't have to laugh. Last call. Any questions? So, that kind of concludes some of the major ideas associated with the Enlightenment. Um, very, very influential, very, very, uh, I lost my train of thought right there. I'm going to hand to you our warm-up and cool-down sheets. Please start work on the cool-down quietly.